<laughs> Guys, welcome back to the bluegrass. We're on a huge adventure today. We're having so much fun you can't even, <laughs> well, you just can't even believe how much fun we're having today. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to take you and I'm going to show you something special here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we're on a, a friend of mine's farm and on this farm he raises corn and uh, soybeans and he's got an awesome hemp crop and I bet none of you guys have ever seen a hemp field in real life. So I'm going to do you the, you know, the next best thing. I'm going to show you one right here on video. It's just our normal stuff. We're out doing puppy sized adventures, but I wanted to show you because some people, you know, they'll, they'll ask me, they'll say, Tony, what if I have different kinds of dogs? Like, so Jax and uh, Buddy, they live together, right? And uh, you guys all know <laughs> Buddy, the king of the Morkies, right? Okay. So uh, he lives with Jax. And, and so Buddy gets tired, you know, a lot easier than Jax does. And a Buddy can't negotiate some of the physical obstacles that Jax can uh, negotiate. So when we take them out, I just throw Buddy in this uh, King Morky pack. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to go investigate this pond. We're going to do a little bit of environmental socialization. I'm going to let uh, my dog be a mentor to Jax, and hopefully we can get him in the water today. I might have to get my shoes off and get muddy. And I'm going to let this guy get down and run around and play and explore. But whenever he gets tired, see, I'll just pick him up and put him back in the King Morky pack. So we're all going to have a good time. I hope you enjoy it. So here we are, ready to do some big time exploring. Oh, ho, ho, ho. dang, and here's Mr. Jax. We've come up here to this pond, and uh, what our goals for the day are is just to get Jax acclimated to the water, right? So always when you go out for your training sessions, try to make sure that you have some simple, well-articulated goals. Don't try to make all your progress in one session, right? So I'm gonna be happy today if uh, Jax will just follow Mr. No Name out here and swim around. If I get that, I'm gonna walk out of here with the biggest smile on my face you can imagine. If I get anything extra, that's just gonna be a big time bonus. <laughs> We're gonna come out here, and Mr. No Name's already been out here making everything muddy, of course, that's how he does. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna show Jax how we party in the bluegrass state. You know, we like to take our shoes off and uh, really get, <laughs> get out and get dirty and muddy and have a good time, you know? So here's Jax and uh, Oh my gosh, getting kind of deep, but he's uh, doing perfectly. Now I had him on this leash just in case that, uh, you know, he gave me a hard time coming out here, but he's doing pretty good. So what am I going to do next? I'm going to take this dummy and I'm going to throw it for Mr. No Name. Now theoretically what's going to happen is Jax is going to see Mr. No Name uh, chase this dummy and hopefully he'll at least chase Mr. No Name. We don't know that he's going to chase the dummy, but hopefully he'll see, see his mentor do the activity and he'll want to do the activity too. And look, that's about perfect. <laughs> Dang, nice. That's awesome. Now, see that right there? We're going to discourage that over the course of time. Like, we don't want him going and taking something else out of a dog's mouth. But Mr. No Name, he used to do that to Henry all the time. So, don't feel too sorry for Mr. No Name. And then if you'll notice, <laughs> the King Morky, he's just up here riding <laughs> in his little carriage. And uh, he's watching the peasants, you know. And like I always try to put myself in the mindset of what the dog's thinking. And that's really what I feel like is going on here. This little guy's up here, you know, he's got his imperial staff keeping him around. And uh, he's watching the peasants entertain themselves in the muddy water. But see this, this is perfectly, uh, this, is, this is going perfectly according to plan. Now don't get frustrated. If when you take your dog out, uh, they don't jump right in the water, you know? I mean, people email me all the time and they're like, hey, Stoney, you know, I tried, to, I tried to take my dog out to the creek or I tried to take my dog out to the river or whatever and, you know, he wouldn't get in or, or, or he, he got in but he wouldn't stay in or he got in but he was scared. This, guys, this isn't, like, this is going exceptionally well today. Right? It doesn't go like this all the time. I mean, a lot of times we come up here and, and, and Mr. No Name, he'll jump off and it'll take us 10 or 15 minutes to get a dog over here in the water, you know. Just every so often do you have one like Jax that likes to jump right in. And you'll notice right there, see how Jax is kind of swimming? That's something else that you do not have to panic about and you don't have to work on. When they're, when they're young and they don't know how to swim real well, they'll kind of beat the water with their front paws and they'll get a little bit nervous about it. But... But all in all, it works itself out. Uh, it works itself out very quickly. 
All right, now what I'm seeing here is like Jax is going after Mr. No Name, but then as soon as he gets to Mr. No Name, he's attempting to actually get the retrieving item. So to me, like I feel like I might be able to push this session just a little bit. So I'm going to put Mr. No Name up for a minute, and we're going to see if Jax, uh, if maybe he'll fetch, you know, because he might or he might not. I'm not going to put any pressure on him, uh, but I just feel like he's kind of showing me that he's ready to take that step. Oh. Okay, so. <clears throat> Woohoo! All right. So we put Mr. No Name up, and now it's just me and Jax out here partying, having a good time in the mud, and let's see what's going to happen. Okay, so let, let me just take just one second and remind you that when you first go out for the day, set a very simple and achievable goal. I have already accomplished my goal. If I don't get anything else out of Jack's today, I'm perfectly happy. I'm not pressuring him here. I'm not pushing him here. I just saw in him that he kind of looked like he was wanting to go out there and retrieve, so I'm going to give him that chance. I'm going to show him his retrieving item. I'm going to throw it a little ways. I'm going to come out here and meet him, see if he gets it. If he misses it, that's that's fine. No worries. I can always go get Mr. No Name. Now, see right here, that's what I was telling you about beating the water with their paws. You see how he kind of beat it out of the way? Sometimes, oh my gosh, very nice. Sometimes with a young dog, like you send them to retrieve, and man, they're doing real well. They go out there, and then they accidentally hit the retrieving item with their paws, and it'll move around, and then they'll turn around and come back to you. Don't fuss at them. Uh, just always keep in mind that you might be the one getting in the pond and fetching the retrieving item. So don't throw the retrieving item into the pond any farther than you're willing to go to get it. All right, we're going to try it again. Throw it a little farther. See what he does. Now I threw it a little farther because I wanted him to kind of get his swimming stroke down pat on the way out there. See what's going to happen here. He's struggling, he's struggling. Dang, very nice. Oh my gosh, Jax, you are awesome. Now guys, when you see a dog make that kind of progress, <laughs> as a dog trainer, you get super happy because that kind of progress uh, <laughs> equals another zero on the bill. <laughs> so right then, what happened when Jax put that second effort in to go get that retrieving item uh, and he stuck with it and he got it, then uh, you know I start thinking, okay, when I make that invoice out, I'm gonna go ahead and add me a zero. Uncle Stoney might be getting him a new truck, new shotgun, something. All right. Now, so what's that, George? Is that my third retrieve? Okay, so that's three retrieves. All I was after today, very nice. All I was after today is Jax to get in the water and kind of walk around and swim around and chase Mr. No Name. Now, of course, we've been working on fetching at the, at the kennel. And you know I've got that little pool at the kennel. So we've been working on fetching in the water in my pool. And uh, we brought him out here and he showed me. Hey, Stoney, some of that stuff we've been working on at the kennel, I think I can do it out here in the real world. So I gave him a chance, you know, yard work versus field work. Worked on it at the kennel. I bring him out here and ask him if he can do it. Okay, guys, you know my magic number is three to five repetitions. That's what I like to do with young dogs. Now, I've got three perfect ones. I probably shouldn't go for a fourth, uh, but <laughs> I always do every time. Let's see what happens. Guys, really try your best to resist that one more time problem because that, that affects dog trainers a lot. You know, you'll get something and it's going real well, and then you'll try to do it one more time. And, and, and instead of ending on a high note, uh, you know, you'll end on not so high a note. But that worked. Dang, that's four perfect retrieves, right? A Little bit of hand beating, but not much. Uh, so should I stop there, Georgie? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm gonna do it one more time. <laughs> uh, let's go out there and see if he gets it. Dang, that was the best one yet. I am so confident that that dog's going to make a perfect retrieve. I'm going to go ahead and go up here to the four-wheeler and get ready to go on this next part of our adventure. Dang. You're going to make it, Jax? Oh, my gosh. Dang. Victory. Oh, perfect delivery to hand. Guys, resist that urge to do it one more time, but I can't lie. When you do it one more time and it works out perfectly, it's the best feeling in the world. Charlie, give me a high five. Dang, nice. Sure, we can go to the lake.
When we first started off on the four-wheelers, I'm sure a lot of you noticed that we were in the middle of a big old cornfield. I mean, corn is a very recognizable row crop. It's a tall, skinny green plant, got these little tassels at the top. It's real cute. You see it in all the Thanksgiving posters and all the Halloween cartoons. I mean, everybody knows what corn looks like. And as important as corn is to the American agricultural establishment, there's another crop that's just as important, and that's soybeans. But uh, very few people know what soybeans look like, so we figured we would show you. Cameraman? Pan over there and show them what a field of soybeans look like. Now I know one of the things that you're wondering is why that on this single farm we would have some fields planted in corn and some fields planted in soybeans. Okay, it's because of a concept known as crop rotation. Okay, when you're planting crops, guys, the, each of those crops take different things out of the soil and put different things back. So when you have a grass crop, you generally rotate it with a legume. So like a legume would be like a soybean uh, or alfalfa and a grass crop would be like wheat or corn. So the advantages of, uh, of a legume is that legumes take nitrogen out of the air and put it into the ground. That makes it easy to come back the next year and plant a grass crop because grass crops can't take nitrogen out of the air. They have to utilize nitrogen that's already present in the ground. Okay, so we rotate them. Uh, we'll plant uh, over here this year will be soybeans and on the other side of that tree line will be corn. Now what's going on right now in this field is the soybeans are taking certain things out of the soil but they're putting back something very important. They're taking nitrogen out of the air and putting it into the soil. Now over there in that field the corn is taking nitrogen out of that field, right? But it's leaving behind some good stuff too. So now next year they'll be, ro they'll be rotated or they'll be swapped so that the corn can come over here and take advantage of the nitrogen that was left by the soybeans, right, by the legume. We showed you what a whole field of soybeans looked like, but my cameraman wanted to get down and show you what an actual soybean plant looks like. Uh, so we're going to go over here, and I've kind of moved some grass out of the way so you can see one. Guys, this is a whole soybean plant. Now the important part of the plant uh, are these seed pods right here. Now the difference between uh, domesticated or agricultural crops and wild crops is basically boils down to seed density, right? You notice how many of these little pods there are? In a wild plant, there wouldn't be that many pods. And so farmers over the course of uh, thousands of years have genetically uh, manipulated these uh, soybeans and corn and other row crops in such a way as to have them be able to thrive in a variety of situations and produce uh, seeds at a density and for a utility that matches their intended purpose. Uh, agricultural science is amazing. And when you get done watching this video, I know most of y'all are like, uh, you know, dog, uh, you know, you like dog videos, but you want to see something interesting? Start watching some agricultural videos because whatever it is that you think you know about food production, I can pretty much guarantee that you don't know uh, what you think you know. All right. All right, well, we'll get off here and uh, we'll give the King Morky a little chance to get out and get into some stuff, maybe chase a rabbit or two. Oh my gosh, go big man. Jax, you want to get off there? Oh, Jax likes riding on the four-wheeler. <laughs> He's tired from swimming in the pond, so he didn't even want to get down. Did, uh... All right, we'll walk over here and see what's going on. Now around here, guys, you'll see like uh, in the middle of some pond maintenance, like uh, so this little strip here, uh, this has cleared that out and they planted some millet there for some ducks to come in this uh, winter. Now come over here, cameraman, and let's show them this pond. Now when we were at the other pond, you notice it's, it's open and uh, like it's just kind of deep. But when I would step in it, like remember I was telling you my feet were like going down into the, you know, into, into the silt and the mud in the bottom of the pond about that far. Basically what happens is ponds have a lifespan. And so you dig out a pond, you know, it's real deep. And then, uh, you know, after that first year, stuff starts living in it. Well, all that stuff that starts living in it, it dies. And as it dies, it falls to the bottom. Right? And so just over the course of the years, no matter how nice a pond you started off with, the pond will always just turn back into kind of level ground. So you see right here, there's frogs everywhere. You see those frogs going off through there? So all this algae and stuff on the pond, uh, it provides an environment for lots of different stuff to live in. 
but the more stuff that can live in the pond, then the more uh, other living stuff that's attracted to it. So you get some stuff in a pond that's brand new. Then some stuff comes and lives in the pond. Well, when that stuff gets established, something comes along, starts eating that stuff. <laughs> so every time you turn around, there's a new level of life attracted to the pond. Well, it all comes and it lives its life cycle and then it sinks to the bottom. And the next thing you know, I hate to do this because this is so disgusting, but the next thing you know, that's what you've got right there. Look at that old gooey pond mud. That's what I was stepping in earlier. <laughs> so look over at that King Morky. Look at that King Morky chasing those frogs. <laughs> now it wasn't that long ago, guys, that this was a wide open pond like the other pond. <laughs> but not anymore. As the pond becomes more well established, then it, it brings more life. And you know, what's the end of life is death, right? And all the stuff that dies, it falls to the bottom and, and it creates uh, silt, you know, soil, and it just kind of gradually fills the pond up. And that's where this pond's at. So this pond is going to have to be dug out eventually and we're going to have to start over. But look at that Morky. Have you ever seen, can you see that Morky cameraman? To zoom in on him. <laughs> That's a King Morky frog hunter right there. Ain't that crazy? Now I got to get that dirty little joker back on my four-wheeler. This is a especially well-maintained farm here, guys. Belongs to some fellas that uh, care a lot about the environment. And so they make sure that they do everything right on this farm. A lot of times, uh, you know, people take, you know, they take stuff for granted and they don't understand what all goes into the maintenance of land and the maintenance of wildlife. So the people that own this farm here, uh, you, you know, they're, they're dedicated hunters, they're dedicated outdoorsmen, they're dedicated farmers. And so they really care about the environment and they care about the in environment in a way that a lot of environmentalists don't even really understand. That's something that's, uh, that's hard. If you didn't grow up in a farm environment, if you didn't grow up in a, a situation where you had to constantly be, uh, you know, outdoors working around stuff, then sometimes you can't really have appreciation for what goes into land maintenance. No name. This is an industrial hemp field. All right, guys, I had to leave my dogs on the four-wheeler because what I'm going to show you is a uh, fragile little plant. Now, what this is, is an industrial hemp plant, okay? And for all intents and purposes, it looks like any other marijuana plant. The uh, main difference just being that it's not psychoactive. So you could smoke this whole field and you wouldn't really get any kind of effect. Now I had to leave my dogs over on the four-wheeler because at this stage, these things are really, really fragile. Uh, and they're, they're really important to this uh, farmer that's growing them. So I don't want my dogs messing them up. But within just a few weeks, these things get big and they get bushy and they get so strong, you won't believe it. A dog could run around in here all day, it wouldn't hurt it a bit. And uh, bugs don't hurt it. Heck, droughts don't even hurt it. I mean, they're just a real tough plant. And that toughness is one of the things that drew people to the production of hemp originally. You know, basically, if you can make it out of cotton, if you can make it out of plastic, or if you can make it out of wood, you can make it out of hemp, and not only will it be lighter, it'll be stronger, it'll be more durable, in other words, it'll last longer, okay, and it has less environmental impact. This one field here, guys, okay, one field like this, the productive capacity per acre is higher with hemp than any other agricultural product, right? Hemp grows better, it grows faster, it's tougher, it's more durable, and it's more useful, and it can grow in more climates, you know? So there's something that every state could benefit from, from hemp production. But Kentucky is especially well-suited because we have the perfect climate for producing the type of hemp that is good for making animal feed and for making CBD. A saying that you hear around here all the time is that farmers are excited to raise a crop that heals instead of kills. And if we just boil this down to, to, to a simple idea, that's what we're doing with industrial hemp, guys. We're healing the planet, okay? We, for too long in Kentucky, we've been involved in industries, and it's not our fault. You know, we're at the mercy of the of international bankers and corporations that bring their money here because we're a poor state. We're at their mercy, you know, and hemp is going to give us a chance to take a little bit of autonomy back. Once we can get this up and going, we're going we're gonna to make a big dent in the plastic industry. We're going to make a big dent in the animal food industry. And we're really, really, I think this is going to be the biggest benefit of Kentucky-produced uh, hemp is that we're going to make a big dent in the CBD uh, production business because our hemp is the best in the world for producing high quality CBD products. If you suffer from inflammation or cancer, you can't sleep, you're on Prozac, whatever it is, you get you a bottle of Kentucky made CBD oil and see if it doesn't help you.
If my cousins raise it, it'll help you, I promise. All right, now, so that's, uh, that's my little CBD oil, my little hemp uh, production pitch. I hope that, uh, hope that didn't bore you. But guys, look how beautiful that is, right? Look how beautiful that is. That's a plant that makes everybody's life better. Everybody's life better. It makes farmers' lives better. It makes workers' lives better. It's going to make your house last longer if you live where there's storms. It's going to make you be able to get better sleep. When you're able to get better sleep, you're going to do a better job tomorrow. When you do a better job tomorrow, guess what? Your, <laughs> your boss is going to pay you more money, right? And if you take you some Kentucky CBD oil and you go to work and your boss doesn't pay you some more money, you send me his name, okay? And I'll call him out right here on YouTube because I know for sure if you're on that Kentucky CBD oil, then you're putting in a good day's work. All right, I'll see y'all later.